mayor is on his way, so our other witness will be here. But we're going to go ahead and start with opening statements, and I recognize myself for five minutes. Thank you all for being here today in Port Arthur, Texas, for a field hearing on the Energy, Climate, and Grid Security Subcommittee titled Biden's LNG Export Ban, How Rush to Green Politics Hurts Local Communities and U.S. Energy Security. Today, we'll hear from witnesses in the communities that support the United States liquefied natural gas or LNG industry. The U.S. is blessed with tremendous natural resources and an entrepreneurial spirit required to harness these resources and propel the United States to global energy dominance. America is the number one producer and exporter of liquefied natural gas in the world. We also reduce emissions more than any other nation, both here at home and abroad. We have communities like the one here in Port Arthur to thank for this success. LNG exports strengthen energy security, decrease energy prices here at home, support and create U.S. jobs, and help to lower emissions globally. U.S. LNG exports could support up to 452,000 additional American jobs and add up to $73 billion to the United States economy by 2040. They can also create billions of dollars of revenue for the federal, state, and local governments. Despite the many benefits of LNG exports, President Biden has ignored both reality and science to heed the calls of his radical environmental base. As we all are well aware, in January of this year, President Biden issued an indefinite ban on the issuance of LNG export permits to non-free trade agreement countries while it conducts a review to consider the climate impacts of natural gas. The administration indicated no endpoint or a timeline to its decision, which it announced via a press conference and press release. This rash decision by the Biden administration will have nationwide impacts as it will be detrimental to jobs and to economic development in communities like this one that support the U.S. LNG industry. It threatens good-paying American jobs across the entire economy, from gas production to manufacturing and even those in restaurant and hospitality jobs. The states most impacted are already feeling the pain due to the uncertainty this announcement has created. This uncertainty will chill investment, discourage planned investment in natural gas production, and have lasting impacts on thriving energy industry here in Texas. It is clear this decision is politically driven and reflective of an administration that continues to put the priorities of the environmentalist over the interest of the American people. In addition to harming our domestic energy industry, President Biden's LNG export ban is a gift to Vladimir Putin. Global demand for gas is expected to increase 46% by 2050, and our European and Asian allies who want to do business with the United States will look to Qatar, Russia, Iran, and other adversaries of the United States to meet their growing energy needs. The Biden administration and many House Democrats claim to support Ukraine, yet they promote an LNG export ban which bolsters Putin's stranglehold over Ukraine. Republicans in the House of Representatives recognize the urgency of reversing this ban. We recently passed H.R. 7176, the Unlocking Our Domestic LNG Potential Act. This would reverse the Biden administration's export ban and would remove all Department of Energy restrictions on the import and export of natural gas. Export facilities will stood ha will, would still have to receive certification from FERC, but DOE would no longer be able to halt exports like the Biden administration did for political gain. Port Arthur and the folks here today are the backbone of the American energy industry. It is a major energy hub, home to many oil and gas facilities, including several LNG export terminals. You all are who we have to thank when we turn our lights on, start our engines, and blast our AC in the hot summer months or the heat and the cold winter days. You are who the Biden administration should have consulted with prior to his decision. So I'm glad you're here today and you're attending this hearing, and uh, we look forward to hearing from our witnesses and uh, you sharing your perspectives on the benefit of U.S. LNG. Now, y'all can probably understand me. I'm from South Carolina, but I want you to know I'm an honorary Texan. Governor Abbott may be an honorary Texan, so uh, it's glad to be in my adopted home. So I'll now recognize as the designee of the ranking member, um, the gentlelady from here in local in Houston, Texas, Ms. Fletcher, for five minutes for her opening statement. 
Well, thank you, Chairman Duncan, and thank you for bringing us here to see and hear more about this important topic today, and I thank Mr. Weber for hosting us in the 14th Congressional District. Today's hearing is an important opportunity to learn about LNG exports and the role that LNG plays in our country's present and future, from our local communities to the global community, and the opportunities and challenges that are before us today. Today has been a collaborative and useful one, and I look forward to today's hearing as an opportunity for us all to learn more. And I'm sure there will be many areas of agreement and beneficial ideas for action. I do, however, want to note my disagreement with the title of the hearing. January's announcement from the Biden administration is not an export ban. LNG exports continue and will continue each day. The administration announced a temporary pause on the approval of export permits at the Department of Energy while it reviews and updates its public interest determination process. Facilities with existing permits will continue to operate and fill orders. That includes facilities that are under construction and several that have not even begun construction. Proposed projects, which go through a multi-step process, will continue to advance through FERC for the siting, construction, and operation of facilities. And it is with that in mind that I think today's hearing can and should be instructive. The Department of Energy's determination of public interest until today has evaluated environmental impacts and cost impacts for consumers. DOA, DOE last updated its environmental and cost analysis more than five years ago when LNG exports were less than half of what they are today. It is not unreasonable for the DOE to take an objective look at export applications with the most comprehensive, up-to-date analysis of the economic, environmental, and national security considerations of public interest. It is not the same thing as a ban on exports. That said, I know that the pause has caused concern and uncertainty for people, for projects, for communities, and for companies. So our hearing today is an important opportunity for us to participate in the process and fact gathering. This field hearing is an opportunity to address the principal issue areas that I think have been raised and that the, the pause is seeking to address. The three C's, climate, cost, and communities, with a particular emphasis on communities here today. Multiple administrations of both parties have found that exporting LNG is in the public interest. Cleaner American natural gas is more competitive on the world market, and it is an important tool in addressing climate change. But that does not mean that our work to reduce emissions and safeguard communities is complete. Communities, neighboring facilities need to be confident that their needs and concerns are addressed in the planning process. It was only in 2016 that the first LNG export terminal in the lower 48 states began exporting natural gas. Since then, in just eight years, the United States has become the world's top exporter of natural gas. The growth that we've seen from the shale revolution has powered our economy here in Texas and across the country and has increased our national security. Today, under the Biden administration, the United States is producing more crude oil than any other country at any point in history. Three months ago, U.S. natural gas production reached an all-time high. Record energy growth has continued under this administration. LNG exports help create a future marked by affordable, accessible, reliable, and sustainable energy that promotes global stability. By involving stakeholders and hearing about the challenges and opportunities for improvement, we can address concerns and move into our energy future with confidence together. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today and working with our partners in the federal government to develop sound energy policy that takes into account what we are learning today and engages stakeholders throughout the process. Thank you, and I yield back. Generally yields back. Uh, it's now my pleasure to recognize the um, gentleman from here in Houston, Texas area, your congressman, and he's the designee of the full committee chair, Chair Rogers, Mr. Weber, for five minutes for opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'll just ask, that it's great to be back in Southeast Texas. So if you all don't mind me appointing a personal privilege, we appreciate the subcommittee chair, Jeff, uh, for coming up here and doing this, holding this hearing. Would you all give him a hand, please, Jeff Duncan? You bet. 
And we appreciate Miss Fletcher coming from what she calls the Energy Corridor of Houston, but she's got the bean counters and the buildings and the executives. We've got the people down here in Southeast Texas, Rennie, making it happen right here, salt of the earth. So thank you for what y'all do. And thank you, Chairman Duncan, uh, and the whole Energy and Commerce staff, by the way, uh, and my team, quite frankly. And by the way, I've got Janet Brown here. Y'all give her a hand. I've got Blake Hopper, give him a hand. Arthur, I give him a hand. There's Jared. And I saw Dodie. Where are you, Dodie? I'm sorry. Right. Give her a hand. So we work for y'all. We never forget that. And listen, if y'all ever have uh, a problem, you can call the cell phone and I'll give it to you. It's Dodie's. So no, no, no. I'm just kidding. Listen, uh, I want to say that we all absolutely have, know how important this field hearing is today. Uh, it's about the positive impacts that LNG facilities play in a community like Port Arthur, and y'all know the history of Port Arthur. Y'all live here, you work here, you play here, you go to church here. Uh, it's about the positive impacts that LNG can play, have been playing, uh, and I have to agree with our chairman, uh, uh, with all due respect to our chair, the, chair, the lovely lady from Houston, that President Biden uh, is going to have an impact, his hold, a ripple effect, through Southeast Texas, our great district. Everyone who has gathered here today undoubtedly knows how critical LNG is, not just to our country, not just to our state, but to Southeast Texas specifically. Uh, it is very, very critical, and you know because communities, families are collecting a paycheck and putting food on the table. It is also critical, LNG uh, chemical facilities are, for small business owners in our community. It is critical, the mayor knows this, for the development of our great city of Port Arthur. Uh, it is critical as the next generation that's currently studying right here at Lamar State University, right, is learning all there is to know about being operators and working at the plants. They can have a career in the LNG industry. And guess what? These critical investments might disappear if the ban remains in place and goes on too long. So just a few miles away from here is the home of Port Arthur LNG, Golden Pass LNG, both of which provide, as y'all know, thousands of direct jobs and billions of dollars back into our great community. I would be remiss if I didn't mention Chenier LNG, a stone's throw across the border in that other foreign country, Louisiana, or what we call East Texas, Larry, which also employs Texans. My district, District 14, your district, by the way, is also home to Freeport LNG located in Missouri County where these investments likewise benefit the community there. Joe Biden's ban directly jeopardizes Port Arthur's LNG, which broke ground on construction last month. They have been fully approved for their phase one project, Lizzie is correct about that, and they will hire upwards of 6,000 jobs with more than 100 contracts with vendors, local vendors, for construction valued at $180 million. When the ban was announced, they were actually in process of applying for the permits and approvals for phase two. Now they're not sure they can continue with phase two because it's been put on hold, which is an expansion that would help meet future demand for U.S. LNG supplies for Europe, Asia, as well as other global markets. This abrupt, what I consider to be politically motivated ban, brings that project to a screeching halt. Their investors are now encountering a lot of uncertainty. This ban will cost Southeast Texas thousands of jobs and hurt businesses that rely on projects like this. So let me just say, I'm going to turn this page, let me just say that being here with this as one of our firebrands for what we need to do in, in Port Arthur, Texas is ex so important to us. Today, we want to highlight how our great Lamar State College, Port Arthur, has been able to start that program to teach and equip the next generation of LNG workers. These LNG companies have donated money, given scholarships, and partnered with lo not only local colleges, but local high schools as well. We want to highlight the investments that LNG companies are making to restore marine habitats, improving infrastructure like highways and bridges, not to mention the work they do in community like donating meals, gifts, and partnering with local groups for local projects. I could go on and on about the positive role these companies play in our community, here at our great Southeast Texas, really indeed in our entire nation. So while this administration and some of my colleagues in Congress are demonizing American LNG without any regard 
for its countless benefits it brings, I trust that this hearing will serve to bring some reality to them, to highlight what benefits those bring, and it is a reality that American LNG leads to American energy dominance, American jobs, and American leadership overseas, especially at a time when the world seems to be on fire and enemies are moving around everywhere. I want to thank each of the witnesses today for taking time out of their busy lives to share y'all's perspectives with the committee today. And thank you to all the familiar faces in the crowd for being here. Chairman Duncan, I yield back. Chairman yields back. We have uh, one-tenth of the full Energy and Commerce Committee here today, only four members. I'm going to step outside the uh, boundary here and recognize Mr. Griffith for a uh, brief opening statement. And, and it will be brief. I like to give my friends from Texas a hard time. I come from Virginia, particularly the western part of Virginia, and we take responsibility for Texas. I think the gentleman's time has expired. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think Randy's heard this story before. I usually give my Texas friends this story. But uh, I have ancestors that are buried with Houston's ancestors in a little cemetery in Rockbridge County, Virginia. I represent Austinville, where Stephen Austin was born. And I, and I have a little town called Rural Retreat where the pharmacist was Dr. Pepper. And his daughter ran off with his assistant and came to Texas. So if you start thinking about Texas, it might not have happened if it hadn't been for people from western, the western part of Virginia. Now, we're different than those northern Virginia folks. I just want to make that clear. And I come from uh, an energy-producing district, uh, coal and a little bit of natural gas. And, you know, I think about a dozen barrels a month of oil, uh, not much, but uh, we are the coal producing part of, uh, of Virginia and very proud to represent them and very glad to be with you all today because energy is important to this country across the board and particularly liquefied natural gas is extremely important in the geopolitical safety and peace prospects for not only the United States, but the entire world. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, point of personal privilege, please. I yield. <laughs> I just want to say we had another great one of our employees come in. Christine Thickman, raise your hand there. So y'all give her a hand, would you? Thank you for all of Congressman Weber and Fletcher's staff uh, that serve the district so well. If we're going to get into Texas, William Barrett Travis was from my district, and I uh, drew a line in the sand. <laughs> so God bless Texas. May God bless the United States. I, and I guess I should have mentioned Crockettville then. <laughs> that concludes the member's opening statements. The chair would like to remind members, pursuant to committee rules, all members' opening statements will be made part of the record. So ordered. Okay. I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here. We came to hear from you and I uh, appreciate you testifying. Our witnesses today are uh, Mr. Thurman Bill Barty, um, the mayor of the city of Port Arthur, Dr. Betty Renard, president of Lamar State College, Port Arthur, Mr. John Beard, Jr., founder and CEO of Port Arthur Community Action Network, and Mr. Larry Kelly, port director and CEO for the Port of Port Arthur. So per committee custom, each witness will be given five minutes uh, for an opening statement, followed by a round of questions from uh, the members of Congress. Uh, the light on the timer in front of you, it'll go green when we recognize you, go to yellow when you're starting to run out of time, it goes to red, your time's up, and I'll just ask you to wrap up. We can kind of stay on time here. So I'll now recognize Mayor Marti uh, for five minutes to give an opening statement. And you can cut the mic on in front of you there. First, I'd like to say good afternoon to each of you and to this great crowd uh, who are gathered here uh, in the city of Port Arthur and uh, to this uh, portion, uh, segment of the subcommittee on uh, energy, climate, and grid uh, security at this uh, field hearing. Uh, as it's stated, I am Thurman Bill Barty, mayor of the greatest city in the state of Texas, which happens to be Port Arthur, Texas, and you are situated in that city as I speak. Now, to the Honorable Chair and to the members of this committee, I uh, begin this dialogue with a commendable thank you uh, for allowing indulgence from the uh, municipal government, which has jurisdiction where this affected facility is situated. Now, I in no way am here to bash or discredit the Biden-Harris administration on its position on the matter of permitting. However, I do appeal 
to the said administration to reconsider and subsequently abandon its present course of discontinuance or disallowing the permitting process to go forward. The city of Port Arthur is home to several petrochemical facilities, and we proudly embrace the fact of having the largest of such facilities in North America, and here we even say in the entire world. With such industrial neighbors come the necessity of relational interactions with the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, it's known as TCEQ, and even the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. These agencies are trusted within our community to be sure that the air quality we all breathe is not contaminated and able to sustain life. Now, in the past, we have relied on collaborations with these agencies to support the economic stability of our community and the physical health of the citizens who call Port Arthur, Texas home. As I ponder the significance of this hearing on today with relations to the future economic impact of the LNG industry on our city and in our city, I beg for compromise of the positions of all who are actually authorities in the process at hand. As aforementioned, with the petrochemical industry, the LNG industry is alive and well within the jurisdictional confines of the municipal governance of which I represent. The rush to green concept as it is being applied to this said LNG supplier will have a negative impact on the economic growth and stability of the city of Port Arthur. The jobs Port Arthurans have during this construction phase will be compromised negatively if the permitting is continued to be disallowed. The economic impact of businesses supplying materials and goods during this operation will harm families' abilities to continue with specific qualities of life. The negative impact will then spread to the region and ill effect thousands of workers and their families. Committee, I implore you to seek an amicable resolve to the present position uh, by agencies which have authority to bring about the compromise needed to continue the economic growth for our fair city and to provide a living, sustaining, environmentally friendly coexistence of the industrial neighbors with the residents of the city of Port Arthur, Texas. Jobs and the creation of opportunities for families to thrive is the lifeblood of any community. Port Arthur, like any other community, has an obligation to offer to its citizens. This opportunity is made with real supporting opportunities to this institute, by these entities, rather, and bring about possibility for a better quality of life. Every citizen of Port Arthur does not want the LNG to be non-existent. However, if my time up, I'll get more seconds. Non-existent, however, we want this facility to comply with federal and state authorities on emissions and regulated occurrences at the facility. Doing so, the possibilities of economic stability for the citizens increase. So let us be the community who stands 
for environmental wellness and economic stability and growth. And now I yield. Gentlemen, it's time to expire. I gave you a little lenience there because you are an elected official as well and you speak for a constituency. Thanks for your words. Dr. Reynard, uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you and welcome to Port Arthur. My goal today is to paint a picture of Lamar State College, Port Arthur, and acknowledge the impact of the pause on LNG exports on the college. Lamar State College, Port Arthur, is situated in one of the most urban and economically disadvantaged communities in Texas. The per capita income is $24,065, and 27.6% of Port Arthur residents live below the poverty level. The educational attainment of residents also falls far behind national trends. Only 11.4% of residents, for example, have a bachelor's degree or higher, while the national average is 34.3%. Time and again, we have seen that one of the solutions to lift individuals out of poverty is through education. The college offers associate and certificate programs, and considering the industry in the area, it is no surprise that several of the largest educational programs are related to the manufacturing industry. The campus has a diverse ethnic student population and is classified as a Hispanic serving institution. The unduplicated student headcount for the fall 23 semester was close to 4,000 students. Because of its open door policy and the composition of the region, LSCPA enrolls large numbers of educationally and economically disadvantaged students. Student profiles include descriptions such as socioeconomically disadvantaged, academically underprepared, first generation student, and member of an at risk ethnic group. The campus also has concerns that too many of our students experience homelessness, food insecurity, and general economic challenges. I frequently describe those challenges by reminding the public that LSCPA students are one flat tire away from dropping out or stopping out of college. Support for LSCPA students is therefore absolutely vital for their success. Over time, Port Arthur has become a premier location for LNG industries due to its strategic location along the Gulf Coast. The impact of the LNG industry cannot be understated. The construction and expansion of the LNG industry contribute to the local and national economy by creating new jobs and generating revenue through employment opportunities, tax revenues, and investments in infrastructure. The LNG industries also routinely support Lamar State College Port Arthur. Each LNG plant, for example, funds scholarships. Chenier LNG and Port Arthur LNG recently donated funds to support an EDA grant application by the college. Today, the LNG plants in Port Arthur are under construction, so they do not at this time have interns. However, LSCPA does have interns at some of the petrochemical plants in Port Arthur. Manufacturing interns on average earn about $16 per hour. It's therefore not unrealistic to suggest that future LNG internships would result in full-time positions that pay anywhere from $64,000 to $109,000. Contractors building the Port Arthur LNG plant have also engaged LSCPA to provide craft training. That training not only trains local residents for employment in the industry, but it also provides income to the college. Overall, the LNG industries have dedicated hundreds and thousands of dollars to provide scholarship, equipment, internships, grant support, and training programs. Those donations enhance educational opportunities and strengthen partnerships between academia and industry to benefit students, faculty, and the broader community. Absent those scholarships, students are forced to reduce the number of classes they register for or delay their education altogether. Absent those scholarships, the college would reduce the number of classes scheduled. If continued, programs may close due to low enrollment. Absent training equipment, students would not experience or learn about the real world work site provided by equipment. The quality of training and the subsequent workforce would decline. Absent LNG plants that are operational, internships and apprenticeship opportunities for students would surely disappear. Generally speaking, the impacts of reduced industry support would contribute to the low educational attainment 
and existing poverty in Port Arthur. It is my hope that the information I have provided will help make an informed decision regarding the pause of the LNG exports. Again, I want to thank you for organizing this field hearing, and I'd be happy to answer any easy questions. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Reynard. Uh, Mr. Beard, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ranking member, Congressman Weber, Congressman Griffith, welcome to Port Arthur and to all of you here, visiting guests and friends. I'd like to thank you for inviting me here today and for coming to my hometown of Port Arthur, Texas. Various policymakers I've spoken to know they have an open invitation to come to this community and to learn firsthand about the impacts LNG is having on our community. First, I'd like to offer prayers and best wishes for a full and complete recovery to Congressman Raul Gravalcha. I am a proud, lifelong member of Port Arthur and resident, born and raised on the fence line, a three-term city councilman and mayor pro tem, an Exxon Mobil retiree, and I say that ashamed, unashamedly, with 38 years of service. I am happy to share my firsthand experience with members with this with regards to the Biden pause on LNG export permits to countries without U.S. free trade agreements. That is more accurately what this hearing should be titled, because President Biden did not propose a ban on LNG as the hearing suggests. This pause on a narrow set of permits will give the administration time to evaluate and update the public interest determination for LNG exports. Playing politics and misleading the public about the true nature of President Biden's action on LNG is shameful and disturbing. The lives of communities like mine and those along the LNG supply chain are not something to play with. Port Arthur is a sacrifice zone, a community inundated with decades of pollution from industries that take their profits and leave us with toxic waste, air pollution, and all the health impacts that come along with it. I personally live in the shadow of massive petrochemical and LNG infrastructure where many of you in Washington have never ventured let alone had to breathe toxic air day in and day out. Further up the fossil fuel supply chain are other frontline communities that suffer from the impact of fracking pipelines, compressor stations that are robbing communities of water while perpetuating unconscionable harms to human health. It is for these reasons that we need the pause, not a ban, it's a pause, on the approval of LNG projects. This pause will give us time as a nation to fully understand the full impacts of these projects on communities like mine when the Department of Energy makes its determination on the impacts of LNG on communities. This, as we've heard earlier, has never done, been done before, which is why communities like Port Arthur continue to live with such disproportionate, unhealthy burdens. I want to thank President Biden for taking the time to evaluate this and urge him and Congress to work together to ensure there's a robust and thorough evaluation of the impacts of LNG and other harmful industries before more communities suffer the burdens brought on Port Arthur by fossil fuel industry and their blind pursuit of profits. Communities across the country are experiencing increased frequency and intensity of droughts, wildfires, and other climate change impacts. As a matter of fact, since 2005, Port Arthur has seen five major hurricanes and at least that many smaller ones one of which produced the largest rainfall ever recorded in the United States of 68.58 inches. That was Hurricane Harvey. The public interest determination, though, needs to go beyond climate impacts. Many of you on this committee cite the need to support our allies with USLNG, yet our same allies, some of whom I have visited in the European Union and other nations, tell us that they do not want our gas. A letter from over 60 members of the European Parliament points out that Europe does not need more gas that is being touted and implored the Biden administration to again evaluate the impact of LNG on U.S. communities as well as our shared climate. Looking at the public interest is important because of frontline community health impacts, national security, climate, consumer impacts because exports are inflationary and also those imports, ex exports impedes the transition off of fossil fuels to clean, green, renewable energy. Once again, I thank the President and the Department of Energy and ask that they work toward a robust and thorough evaluation of the cumulative impacts 
of the industry of fossil fuels on communities like Port Arthur in their decision making. And I urge Congress to not use Port Arthur and other communities disproportionately burdened by the fossil fuel industry as bargaining chips and who are supportive on the pause on LNG project approvals. This pause should not be tied, I say again, not be tied to other critical legislative package and traded away to the benefit of dirty energy's blind pursuit of profits. We in the Gulf sacrifice zone say enough is enough. We refuse to be sacrificed. We are the national interest. Enough is enough. I thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Gentlemen's time's expired. I'll recognize Mr. Kelly for five minutes. Chair and committee, thank you very much. My name is Larry Kelly, and I serve as Port Director CEO for the Port of Port Arthur, and I can report I live, work, and pay taxes here in Port Arthur. On behalf of our Port Commissioners who are present and Port staff, good afternoon and welcome to our community. I am only one of about one million U.S. port workers today that support some two and a half million U.S. jobs. I am pleased to see a number of maritime professionals in the room today. Maritime commerce in Texas represents about 25% of the state's GDP. Slowing, pausing, or stopping LNG export permitting will have a direct impact on maritime commerce and jobs. My comments are about jobs, the economy, and security. Our port is, here, is located here on the Sabine Natchez Waterway and the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway. Our waterways are the lifeblood of our region. As an operating port, we handle a variety of cargoes, including brake bulk, liquid energy, and dry bulk in the form of renewable energy wood pellets for export. We have an active foreign trade zone and engaged in international commerce. As, a, as strategic seaports, both Beaumont and Port Arthur frequently handle military cargo. We both move a sizable volume of project cargo. The project cargo movements are specialized capability supporting industrial development like the LNG facilities in Texas and Louisiana, as well as all other forms of energy infrastructure development. In addition to energy, there are a number of other commodities produced on the waterway by local manufacturers and exported globally, attracting billions in domestic and foreign, foreign private investment. With combined tonnages, Southeast Texas ranks fifth in the nation and is a net exporter. Texas is number one in the nation for maritime tonnage with exports outweighing imports three to one. In broad economic terms, our waterway and our state contribute to a positive U.S. trade balance with partner countries. Creating barriers to foreign trade will have long-term negative job and economic impacts to our community, state, and nation. For the U.S., having a robust export trade supports domestic energy independence along with jobs and economic vitality. LNG is one of the best examples where U.S. energy exports can support our trading partners and allies through long winters and provide political independence versus obtaining energy from our peer adversaries. Large investments like LNG projects that have likely have a design life of 50 years or greater. In all practicality, the infrastructure will exist much longer providing generational opportunities for local employment. If 100, if 100 years seems like a long time, look at around our area where three or four large job producers have 120 plus years of local history providing energy to the nation and the world. These producers are the local tax base, ultimately supporting schools, roads, clean water, and our local economy, a history that has supported five generations of my family. Our region is a complex web of interrelated inputs and outputs for production of energy and products used in our everyday lives. The processes continue to evolve, improve, and innovate, essentially reinventing itself time and time over again. Diversification, innovation, and additional forms of energy are important. LNG is just one part of the story. Stop, stopping or slowing the export effort is like cutting off an arm or a leg of a larger body. One innovation begets another, exampled by Texas leading the way as the largest producer of wind and solar energy. Locally, we are home to a world-scale carbon sequestration efforts and lead the way in renewable future fuel development involving hydrogen, ammonia, geothermal, and biofuel at scale. With several projects under construction, those innovations can only occur because of our existing and continuously evolving energy infrastructure. Our community does face some significant challenges related to employment. Local LNG projects like those impacted by this policy choice will cost 10,000 construction jobs and decades of economic activity for our community. 
The point is every job matters in our community, whether it's at the port, a rail yard, pipeline, local industry, or a hospital. A work stoppage will cost jobs and at minimum expose the project approvals to inflated construction costs as well as add risk to the financial decision-making process. In closing, it is about the jobs, it is about the economy, and it's about our security. I ask for your favorable consideration. I'm pleased to answer any questions and respectfully appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I want to thank all of you for your testimony. We'll now move into the question and answer portion of the hearing. And let me remind everyone, this is an official congressional hearing. So unlike a town hall, we'll only have questions from members of Congress today. And I'll now rec recognize myself to start off that period. I'd first off like to address uh, something that uh, the ranking member said. There has been an increase in oil and gas production in the United States, but it has zero to do with the policies of the Biden administration, which started on day one in a war on American energy production by canceling lease sales in this body of water just offshore called the Gulf of Mexico and other federal lands. He stopped the Keystone Pipeline. I can't point to a single policy initiative from this administration that has helped increase oil and gas production in this country. Oil and gas production increase in this country has, is the result of past administrations, plural. So um, this may not be a ban, but I can tell you that this LNG export pause will have detrimental impact on future investment. These projects like the project we visited today don't spring out of the ground overnight. They require planning and investment and permitting and years of construction processes and create tremendous jobs. And Mayor, every ship that I see, every tug that I see going up that channel there means economic activity, providing jobs. And everyone I've seen is energy related. So Mayor Barty, you stated in your testimony that the policy of the Biden administration's Russia Green agenda will have a negative impact on your community. The latest move by the Biden administration is clearly part of a broader campaign to undercut American energy production. Will you expand on the types of jobs that are created by US LNG and how that will impact your, how they impact your community? Well, presently, the LNG that has been ill affected with the permitting process, the jobs are construction type jobs that are there uh, as far as I've been apprised. Uh, and these jobs now, in Port Arthur, I know we don't have every citizen with the proper skill level for each craft that's needed out there, but there are awesome Port Arthurans who have the skill level, and there are awesome Port Arthurans who actually are actually working in the facility now. Now, for future jobs, once completion of the facility uh, uh, has, has actually uh, uh, gone into force, we would have permanent jobs that hopefully citizens in Port Arthur would qualify for those jobs as well. So the, the economic uh, impact from a facility such as the one that's in particular right now would be a positive economic shot in the arm, so to speak, for the city of Port Arthur. Now, the other LNGs that are there operating now, there are jobs there, and uh, some craft jobs, uh, operator-type jobs, uh, engineering-type jobs, mechanical jobs, welders, carpenters, and uh, even uh, other type of laborers. Uh, those jobs in those facilities are actually jobs that poor authorants have. Now, we don't have, uh, and I don't have at my disposal, an actual, uh, I guess, factor as far as the uh, data on the number of individuals who are employed there. Well, but, I'll, I'll stop you right there and, and move on. My time's going to expire. 500 jobs out at Sabine Pass um, yeah. by Chenier, 500 Zachary uh, contract jobs. That's 1,000 employees. That's three shifts, 12-hour shifts. That's a lot of employment, and that's just one facility, and it's not counting all the other facilities. Future construction jobs for building out uh, facilities. When I think about energy, I think about four key words, production, delivery, utilization, and export. Produce the American resources here that we are blessed with. 
transmit or deliver those resources through pipelines to facilities like this, but also to utilities that can provide the power that we uh, take for granted in this country or the refineries that we saw on the energy corridor to refine that product into useful components that uh, make our lives better and then export to help our friends and allies around the globe lower their carbon emissions and meet their energy needs, especially at critical times when we're facing uncertainty like Ukraine. Let me ask you this. Are you concerned that the uncertainty created by this LNG export ban uh, and overall campaign against oil and gas threatens these jobs and economic development opportunities in this community? Yes, it probably would because then it would uh, ill affect the ability of that producer of those type goods to be shipped or exported to customers and prospective customers that they actually have on board now. There are some contractual agreements for the future of, of this, these facilities and how they will export these, this, this product to those other, either other countries. Those future contracts are in jeopardy if uh, these new permits are, uh, are paused by this administration as they have been. My time's expired. I'll now recognize the ranking member, the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Fletcher, for five minutes. Thank you so much, Chairman Duncan. And I want to thank all of our witnesses today for your testimony. Um, I found it very helpful to hear from you and, of course, to read your full testimony that you submitted before the hearing. Um, and I really think, as I mentioned in my opening statement, that this pause gives us an important opportunity to think about community engagement. And that's something where I think there really have been demonstrated opportunities for improvement, both in assessing um, in assessing the pause, and certainly that's our, our purpose here today. And so, uh, Mr. Beard, I was hoping that you could talk to us a little bit about how the existing LNG facilities that are currently operating in Port Arthur and those that are in the construction process have engaged with concerned community members pri prior to and during the construction and operations. And then maybe if you could um, share with us your thoughts on how folks involved in those entities could do a better job of engaging um, constructively with members of the community to understand the concerns and the issues and try to find that common ground that, that you were mentioning. Thank you, Ranking Member. Uh, first of all, I think all of those companies do try their best as far as they know to publicly engage with the community and talk with community members, but it's more of a function of doing the usual thing, going to the Chamber of Commerce, going to other groups and organizations. But they have to do what we say is to go into the bushes and to the weeds, where people really are. Go into the neighborhoods, work with community organizations and the others. Because one thing that we do know is that Port Arthur's chronically high unemployment is not being affected, despite all the number of jobs you mentioned, Mr. Chairman. We are not lowering unemployment here. We haven't for decades. So what's happening? If they're engaging, then why aren't people being hired? The mayor mentions the fact about training, but we don't have a shortage of trained people. I've got names of 25 people or better on this phone right here, and their resumes have education all the way from two-year associates to master's degrees. But they cannot get an interview or even get a chance to test. Well, how can they be hired? And how also can they be hired when the contractors that come in to this city bring their workforce with them. We have this on knowledge of people who left Port Arthur to come back and get a job, but they would work with another company when that job was over. Hey, why don't you come with us? We're going to be moving to that big project in Port Arthur. So that displaces our workforce. There's not nearly enough being done, because if it were, unemployment figures would change. Uh, thank you, Mr. Beard. I think that's very helpful for all of us to take back. Um, and um, I think we're going to get a chance to ask more questions. So I want to turn uh, quickly my next question, the time I have left, to Mayor Barti, uh, because in your testimony, you talked about um, opportunities that are created um, from these positions. And as we've just heard, maybe more of them could be coming to the citizens of Port Arthur. Um, and so um, do you think that, um, could you talk a little bit about um, opportunities uh, on to bring these facilities and, um, and those who are sort of bringing this development, how, to, how the city could work with them, with the operators to improve um, and mitigate some of the issues that Mr. Beard has talked about? Yeah, on, on the job opportunities, if I, I want to be correct on your, what you would like for an answer, uh, there, there are uh, 
what we call IDAs that, that are actually in place with facilities, with industrial facilities. And there are certain numbers of Port Arthurans that are, are, are actually asked, or, or the, the IDA stipulates mm -hmm. a certain percentage of Port Arthurans to be employed during a certain uh, a specific period of time. If they are not according to the IDAs, then there is a penalty fee that that particular industrial employer uh, would, would actually pay to the city for not fulfilling that particular tenant or article in that uh, agreement. Now, futuristically, with the LNGs, and with this one LNG in particular, the, uh, whenever I, I come into, uh, uh, came in office in 2019, they were beginning the process. The others were already there, and I visited with them, but those agreements were already in, in, in place and functioning. We are hoping that with the present facility that is being uh, constructed and the future of, I think it's the, the train number two, I think that's the proper name for it, that we would have a greater number of citizens prepared, even working with uh, Lamar State College Port Arthur to help provide citizens with the crafts necessary so that the citizens of Port Arthur would be attractive for employment in these facilities. And again, as I said, if they are not employing Port Arthurans, as the agreement says, then there is a penalty Thank that you. the company is assessed. Thank you. I have exceeded my time, so uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back for this round. Yields back. I'll now go to Mr. Griffith from Virginia for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Renard, for having us at your facility. I appreciate that. And my question to you starts off with uh, looking at workforce development, workforce training. Uh, we heard uh, Mr. Beard say that, that there, there's a lot of unemployment and that people have degrees. Do you find that they have the right degrees? Have they gotten the right degrees? And are you trying to get them educated in the, in the areas where you anticipate the jobs are going to be tomorrow and today? So students select, of course, their own degrees and their own career path. Um, they do receive a lot of career counseling on our campus to let them know what some of the opportunities are um, in this area and in terms of employment. So yes, they, they do receive guidance and counseling in that. Um, we do have um, a fairly large um, educational program that services primarily the petrochemical and the um, the LNG facilities. Right now we have about 200 majors uh, in those areas. Um, we also, um, we have a fairly large non-credit training program. So we have contracted, for example, with Bechtel, who is the contractor for the Port Arthur LNG to, to train uh, workforce. So we're doing, we've done some CDL training for them. We're doing some, uh, some craft training for them. Um, we've also partnered, or they have also partnered with Nederland High School to start a welding program to make sure that there are opportunities for individuals that and participate gonna, in those And I'm going to stop you there because uh, I don't know about this part of the country, but in my part of the country, welding jobs pay pretty good money. Is that true here too? Yes, sir. It, they certain, certainly do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mr. Kelly, uh, one of the things I found in, in the uh, coal industry, and of course we've lost a lot of our coal in central Appalachia, which I represented part of, the Virginia part of that. Um, but uh, one of the things we found is it's not just the uh, immediate area that benefits from investment that, uh, I mean, two, two and a half hours away you find uh, companies that have invested because they're building machinery or equipment or they're doing maintenance on equipment that's used in the coal mines. Is that also true at your LNG facilities? Congressman, thank you very much for the question. And, and we do find, and in, in prior to working in the port, I was involved in the uh, petrochemical industry as a contractor, um, a service provider too. And we certainly see spillover effects. And just like if you would follow the path of an economic impact analysis, you have the direct and the indirect, and you have the induced jobs. And we find that that happens in our area. 
we'd certainly like to see more of that. Um, as, a, as a port, I'd, some of my testimony I touched on project cargo, and that implies that some of that cargo came from abroad, highly specialized, and brought in here. But we also handle project cargo going to export, which means it's derived here locally. And that, too, has a spillover effect of providing for other job opportunities. Yeah, I appreciate that a lot. I mean, uh, one of the problems that, that I've had is, is that, the, that and, and one of the problems I have with the pause, and I agree that it's a pause, and uh, people get excited and they call it a ban, they may put it in the title of a hearing and so forth, but, you know, it's not a ban on already existing, but the pause itself has, has negative effects, as you testified to. And here's the, here's the problem I have. They told us the same thing that they're telling y'all now, is that we're going to take, take a pause or we don't need this, and there will be other jobs available. And what my people have discovered, and my district, uh, uh, Dr. Renard, is similar in economics. I, I couldn't find exact per capita numbers to match up with yours, but my household income uh, in my district is just over 50,000. That's household income. And we're 409th out of the 435 congressional districts. So it's a it's an economically stressed area as well. What we found is they said you can find other jobs when they got rid of our steam coal. Our met coal is doing fine. But our steam coal jobs, well, there are some other jobs, but the job at the Dollar General just doesn't pay as much as the job in the coal mine at over $100,000 a year paid. Is that the same thing you find with uh, petrochemicals and LNG? I think if you even look back at Port Arthur's history, and I made mention of uh, our reinvention of ourselves, we've been through periods where there was a massive loss of uh, jobs in the facilities, they reinvented themselves, and you find that there was a, a movement towards the service sector jobs, and you're correct, they do not pay the same as the, the core employer and the job producer that I mentioned had the 103, had 120 year history and my friend here and, and my father and both my grandfathers all worked for that same refinery that they were able to provide that sustainability for the family and that, that core business obviously probably pays higher wages and better benefits, yes sir. All right, and I appreciate that. And with that, my time is up on this round and I yield back. Gentlemen's time's expired. I'll now go to Mr. Weber from Texas for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Renard, I want to come to you. Um, you and as we know, uh, you all are doing a great job here with the college. Uh, and uh, the LNG companies have worked with Lamar State College. Have there been scholarships involved? Absolutely. Uh, there has been some significant scholarships that, um, that each of the LNG plants and the petrochemical industries award each year. And in addition to that, we just accepted a big donation of uh, some equipment last week from one of the local companies. So, yes, they're, I would say they're very supportive. Absolutely, and we love hearing that. And, and in your remarks, <clears throat> excuse me, your testimony, uh, you said that those interns at the facilities get to make about $16 an hour, mm -hmm. and then you said they have the ability, once they graduate and get out, to make anywhere from $64,000 to $109,000. Did I misquote that? You did not. That is from the U.S. Uh, Bureau of Statistics. Okay, so those are pretty good jobs. Yes. Um, I'm going to go to a little bit different uh, point in the discussion. A pause, as we've been talking about it, uh, or as the administration is calling it, has consequences. So let me go through these and see if I can get y'all's agreement. Um, is it true or false that a pause means no income for construction workers? Is that true? I would say that's true. If they put it on pause, Mayor? What was that again? A pause means no income for construction workers when that job is stopped. No, because it doesn't affect that. A Ms. pause. Kelly, you're you're saying it doesn't. That. Larry? As my testimony indicated, it, it provides financial mm -hmm. risk and delayed projects could sure. be a dead project. Sure. And so those jobs would not be created. So let me go step two, back to the college. A pause in that instance, where phase two is stopped, because they, of the uncertainty, they don't know if they're gonna be able, how long the pause is gonna last, whether the investors are gonna have their money there. If a pause isn't, goes on, doesn't it conceivably mean, Dr. Renard, that those same students, after all they've had training, and if they've gotten scholarships, they very well may not have a job when they graduate. Is that possible? That is possible. Thank you. Um, and then I'm going to do this. Uh, as Mr. Kelly said, a pause means less exports from our waterways. Is that true or false? Yes, sir. That would be true. Yeah, thank you. 
And then I'll go back to the mayor, same question, because we, we talk about money for vendors, money for contractors, money for with students if they get jobs. So a pause means less revenue to the city. It would, it would, uh, I, I, however, now, the pause that we are, I think that we're at in question right now hasn't become totally effective. It's not in effect because I think the pause is for phase two and not, it, it doesn't involve the current work that's going on. But however, the students that we are educating now in the next 24 months, if this doesn't change, then it will have an ill effect and a negative uh, uh, impact would be upon us. Well, it does have a pause on those who are looking at investing their money in the market, if you will. And let me give you some factoids about, there may be some disagreement over whether President Biden has a war on energy. But let me say this about the Keystone Pipeline. It was under President Obama uh, when, in 2008, when I was in the Texas House, when he came into office. <clears throat> Here's some factoids about the Keystone Pipeline. And as we know, it would come right here into our area. It carries 830,000 barrels of oil a day. We care about the environment also, just like our friends across the aisle and like all of y'all do. We do care about the environment because I have, I have, believe it or not, I've got three kids, eight grandkids, and even a great-granddaughter, okay? It's true, Larry, I'm old, okay? So the Keystone Pipeline carries 830,000 barrels of product a day. If you took an 18-wheeler that carries around 7,000 gallons and you divided it by... A 42 or 50 gallon barrel that's 140 barrels on an 18 wheeler stick with me here if you divided 140 barrels on an 18 wheeler of 140 barrels of oil 7,000 gallons of oil into 830,000 barrels a day okay that the pipeline would have brought down to us to continue the refining and continue the jobs and grow our avail avail availability to do just that it would take on a daily basis, 5,253 18-wheelers a day to move that kind of product. We care about emissions. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. We uh, have time. We've come all this way, and I know members want to engage in another round of questioning, so we're going to do that, and I recognize myself uh, for five minutes. Um, I'm from South Carolina. We're not an energy state other than nuclear power. But I've traveled down in Louisiana and Texas enough to know the impact of energy jobs and the energy companies on the local community. I'll give an example. I travel from Lafayette down to Port Fouchon in Louisiana. Four lane highway, business after 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 business, after business, after business on both sides of the highway support what happens offshore. Those are good paying jobs. The impact of those companies, those businesses, and their employees on the local community, joining the YMCA and the Chamber of Commerce and uh, going to local churches and tithing and eating at local restaurants and tipping the waitresses, economic impact of energy jobs and energy sector is huge on a community. And I know you know that, Mayor Barty. Um, but I want to direct my line of questioning to Dr. Raynard. We know that U.S. LNG creates good paying jobs that lift communities and individuals out of poverty and betters their quality of life. You just mentioned, I just mentioned some of the things where it supports the community. I'm a big supporter of technical colleges. I'm a big supporter of small community college and large four-year universities. You mentioned that students at Lamar State College generally are socioeconomically disadvantaged, academically underprepared first-generation students or members of an at-risk ethnic group. How critical is the role of LNG and energy industry in general and the college in creating opportunities for those economically disadvantaged? The Porter author. It's a four-letter word, jobs. That's, that is uh, the goal of a good number of our students that enroll at Lamar State College, Port Arthur. Many of them have a specific um, goal in mind in terms of what they want to do and in fact who they want to work for. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the increase in LNG facilities in the region and specifically with the uh, Port Arthur LNG facility under construction, they are interested in working in those facilities. And so for 
for our community and for our students that we serve, having those jobs available so that students can graduate and go to work and support their families and the community at large is, is critical. It's very important. Thank you for the work that you do there to prepare the, the young minds for the jobs that uh, should be available and will be available in the future if we have our way. Mr. Kelly, we have the Port of Charleston, and we deepen that port uh, 45 feet, hope to go to 50 for the big container ships. What are the prospects of growth for the Port of Arthur? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. And having visited the Port of Charleston, uh, my compliments on their efforts of navigating through the permitting process with Army Corps to see that. We have a uh, deepening project here on our waterway to take us from 40 to 48 feet. And thanks to, to local leadership of supporting this, we're in uh, year 22 or 23, that was for impact. Um, we're in year 22 or 23 of that project and we have, they've started the uh, deepening process and it should take a few more years to get there. So obviously that uh, a huge benefit to the movement of uh, tonnage on our waterway. That certainly growth, the port itself, we're under a $250 million capital expansion plan adding to it. We do handle liquid products. We have, as I mentioned in the testimony, uh, dry bulk and break bulk, and we handle a lot of the products other than just uh, just energy. So I think our future is bright on there. Uh, I'm often asked uh, about containers, and Charleston is a emerging large container port, and there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, uh, we, we have some bridge interferences here on our waterway, and we have our neighbors over in Houston that do an outstanding job of uh, handling massive amounts of containers. Let me, let me just follow up. How does LNG export industry play in your projected growth strategy? Yes, sir. For, as the port area of the region, most of these facilities we're talking about are actually at the entrance to the Gulf. So they're, I don't know, 15 miles from here or something like that in, in a fairly remote area. Uh, it supports a greater effort. We have uh, the presiding officer for the Sabine pilots here, and we have the navigation district sponsor here, and and it involves waterway commerce. And so if you look at the numbers, if you add uh, Port of Beaumont and Port of Port Arthur's uh, tonnage areas together, we're fifth in the nation. Uh, a lot of that tonnage is derived from energy, or most of that tonnage is derived from energy. And uh, LNG will certainly add to that. Where that comes into the process is for stability of maintaining our channel once we get it deep into uh, 48 feet. Certainly adds, to, adds uh, to the commerce of our waterway. On a, a typical day, we would sit here in a 24-hour period. You probably see five or six tankers inbound, outbound, um, an equal number of bulkers, and probably about 85 tow barges moving up and down this waterway. One way or another, most of them are somehow tied to energy. Thank you for that. I hope to visit your port one day. Uh, my time's expired. I'll now recognize Ms. Fletcher, who has been frantically scribbling over here with a lot of questions. So you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I do like to make my notes here. And I've made a lot. I can't get to all of them in five minutes, but I really appreciate all of your insights. And I, I want to follow up quickly. Um, we are having a discussion about what the pause means. And I do think um, there are concerns about an indefinite pause. And we've heard that from a lot of people for a lot of the reasons that we're hearing today. But um, I want to make sure that everyone knows that just a couple of weeks ago, Secretary Granholm was in Houston for Sarah Week. And she talked about the pause. And she said that by this time next year, it should be in the rearview mirror. So I think it's important for us to take the opportunity that we have with this pause to solve some real and demonstrated concerns that people have raised and that we think about how we can move forward together. And so, Mr. Beard, I want to come back to you. Um, in your written testimony, you mentioned several issues um, beyond just employment numbers, but health impacts and other concerns and impacts that people in the community have experienced where perhaps a community benefits agreement or some other kind of community engagement could potentially be useful. And I think those are the kinds of things we should be talking about now with the pause of how do we engage communities and what are the kinds of things that we can do to address and alleviate the concerns that you've raised in this process. And so if you could talk a little bit about um, those issues and how maybe the community members and elected officials and others can work together in these projects and in this process to help address some of those concerns, I think that would be helpful for all of us. Well, the first thing, going back to what was said earlier about, uh, I think it might have been the chair, mentioned traveling through Louisiana and seeing all of those facilities and seeing the effect of that. 
But I wonder, did he take a moment to stop in those communities and ask about the health effects of those people there that live in Mossville and that live in other communities that are near there that are suffering from the pollution of industries that are already there? They're inland, 50 miles. There are no LNGs there. So they're not affected by LNG, but they're affected by the pollution coming from SAS oil and some of the larger facilities that have been built there. With regard to what programs happen, we got to go back to the beginning. It starts at the point of extraction out in West Texas in the Permian, where the ancestral and tribal lands of many native peoples is being used, and even those American citizens and people like ourselves whose lands are being taken from them through eminent domain, simply to satisfy this need for oil. You talked about the fact earlier even of these facilities, but there are 25 facilities, some in some form of construction, some are in permitting, but all of them are going forward, yet we already have at least 8 to 11 of those facilities already built. So where this pause would affect the export and shipment of gas already, with more coming online, which is said to be almost double, if not triple, by 2027, how are we hurting the country or hurting our friends if we are able to export more oil and gas just the same? Makes no sense. Keystone Pipeline, as you mentioned, that's just one of four that was affected. The others are still terminating right here in Needleland, Texas, just down the way. So we have to have agreements that start from the beginning of extraction all the way to communities like Port Arthur. It's in the 95th percentile in terms of air quality. What that means is this, that only 5% of cities in the country have worse air than we do. And that air has some of the largest emitters of benzene and other toxins than virtually any place in the country. That's the price we pay. So when you go through these communities, you have to understand and know what they've been suffering for decades, but yet America still depends on them. It talks about the national interest. Well, Texas likes to talk about, as you know, Congressman Weber, seceding from the union. We haven't done that yet, but we're part of that union, and we're part of Texas, and that suffering continues. And those things have to be considered, those impacts, as well as the community impacts, as well as the lack of jobs. How many of those people that are coming out of your programs at Lamar State College are actually being hired. Who's tracking that? Who's tracking tax abatement, Mayor, to make sure that tax abatement is actually putting those people to work? I want to go back to what, and I'll stop, <laughs> what President Reagan said. We trust, but we want to verify. Where's the verification? How do we know they're actually put, putting those people to work? And what jobs are they working in? That's critical. We have to do the full measure of making sure that we get the benefits if you're going to have the pain and suffering inflicted by the pollution and all that's happening. Well, thank you, Mr. Beard. And it, it sounds to me like some of the things that you're talking about, as you said, are beyond the scope of LNG and in, involve other um, other industries and, and certainly um, existing facilities. But it does seem like this is an opportunity um, in this process to talk about how we can identify the potential risks and try to work those into agreements going forward and also continue to address them through other measures that the administration is undertaking at EPA and elsewhere. Right. Well, and let, so, Well, let me speak to that if you I, Well, will. I've gone over my time. I'm sorry ah, to say. I hope okay. one of my colleagues will give you an opportunity sure. to answer the question, but I have to yield back to Chairman Duncan. Thank you. Your late time's expired. I now recognize Mr. Griffith for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if Secretary Granholm can see now that the pause should be in the rearview mirror by this time next year, one would suspect that Secretary Granholm as the Department of Energy recognizes, I would submit, that that should be in the rearview mirror now. That's the position I believe. I think that she's right. It should be in the rearview mirror, whether it be now or next year, but the sooner the better because of the job impacts. Um, Mr. Kelly, you said that most of your uh, business is tied to energy. Most of those boats going up and down, the, as we've seen a couple of them go by while we've been sitting here, are tied to energy. But you have other things that come in through the port as well. Is that correct? Yes, sir. I'm very proud to talk about that. I will not take up all your time, but Give me just uh, 30 real, seconds. real quick, uh, if you know and enjoy things like Viva, Charmin, Bounty, Cottonelle, we have an import that ultimately becomes 
Kleenex and paper towels, and it puts a lot of people to work. We also handle probably for the state a, a third of the fence pickets around here. If you have wooden privacy fence around your house, aluminum that goes into manufacturing a door, window frames, we estimated we handle enough forest products to build about 15,000 homes in Texas last year or Louisiana. And then we, uh, we I mentioned our, we handle an export uh, commodity of uh, uh, wood pellets as a substitute for coal, uh, or goes to the UK. And uh, we- I do wood pellets too. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I wouldn't burn these woods. in your grill though, I, I'll, I'll tell you. No, I'm saying I got them in my district. We <laughs> oh, have, do you? We, okay. We produce so wood you, pellets. you totally yeah. understand uh, that, that component. All this creates jobs, trucking jobs, logistics jobs, uh, longshore jobs here in our community. And then we also export uh, craft liner bore. So here's, here's where I'm going with this. Because of the, the energy component and the chemical component, you're able to have a thriving port. That helps all these other industries too, yes or no? We're all interdependent, and it, it applies to workforce development and, and everything else. And so, you know, whatever you're doing there helps these other industries grow. If we want new industries to come in, and that's a decision that y'all have to make. I can't make that decision for you, but you still need to have that vibrant port. Isn't that true, yes or no? And I'm yes. only doing yes or no so I can get through it fast. Yes, sir. And, um, and, and, and that port's important. Um, we talk about coal, and most of my coal currently runs on Norfolk Southern, but in the north of my district and in the south of my district, the coal runs on uh, CSX which comes out of the Port of Baltimore. Norfolk Southern goes to the Port of Virginia. Port of Baltimore is out of commission. Are y'all able, I, it's not, it's not gonna be feasible to truck the coal down here and ship it out, but, but is it feasible for you all to pick up some of the Port of Baltimore's uh, slack while they're having a hard time? So the reality, it's like a, a large body and it's a finger that's been cut off of our nation and, and those flows move into other areas. And we've certainly experienced that. There was a vessel that's behind the bridge essentially uh, that was canceled and it'll be uh, resubmitted by another vessel uh, through here. And we have seen, I mentioned the eucalyptus pulp, uh, it's been redistributed probably maybe even down to Charleston or some other ports, Jacksonville, on that maybe as far as east as uh, Mobile. And you touched on something, sir, that's absolutely correct. It's the inland movement of the freight that really adds the cost. And having CSX or Norfolk Southern for us, we're now served by the CPKC, which originally KCS, uh, all very true. Yeah, and so when you put a pause on expanding the opportunities here in a particular area, it, it has a ripple effect that could even affect uh, the, the deepening of the port, as I think somebody else mentioned, or the, the channels to the port. Without a doubt, sir, just like uh, hurricane impacts that we may have, it it'll ripples through the various ports and dis disrupts the economic cycle. The other big uh, provider that we provide for is military service, and we're certainly uh, and important and relevant, both Beaumont and Port Arthur, to uh, the movement of uh, military goods. All those have effects. It's a system. It's a system of systems. It may not be um, complex, but it is complicated. <laughs> and, and, and so we certainly serve as one part of that. All right. I appreciate it very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Chairman yields back. I'll now go to Mr. Weber for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to. Um Talk about something that we discussed later, where uh, the great colleges is uh, they're getting scholarships and they're teaching students how to have a living wage and come out and do jobs. And then I think the remark was made, well, yeah, but a lot of these constructions come and they bring their own people with them, and so they go on to the next job and they take their people with them. And I know this is a, maybe a little bit a uh, small pinpointed example, but my beautiful bride grew up in Nederland, Texas. Mr. Beard, when I tell people that, they say, she's a bulldog. And I say, you know her. Yeah. And so her dad, her dad worked here, uh, went, actually went through LIT, but I met Dr. Renard, you and I have talked about that. I graduated in 54, I think. So they were from here. Well, he took a job over in Texas City, okay? They moved to Texas City, and that was the greatest thing that could have happened to this old country boy right here because I met her at Alvin Junior College in 1974. So people can take their skills and they can move. It's a good thing that we're teaching skills. It gives people options. I want to make that observation. Now I'm going to go over to the Sabine Natchez Waterway. Our great Sabine uh, Natchez Navigation District is here, and we appreciate their help. We're talking about dredging out the waterway, Mr. Kelly, as you know, working on that project for a while. 
Um, and so what y'all need to know is all of the funds and the money that has been provided from industry here and that has gone into this Southeast Texas, they actually, Sabine Nation's Navigation District has been able to up their local sponsor amount. Normally, uh, the federal government is looking to, to clean out uh, waterways and stuff. And by the way, Sabine Nation Waterway is the second largest waterway in the Gulf of Mexico, second only the Mississippi River. And so, Mr. Kelly's right. We move more military personnel and equipment out than any other country in the any other port in the in the country, for that matter. But what what has happened here is that they've increased their uh, local share sponsorship to forty percent to encourage the federal government to go ahead and dredge out Sabine Nation's waterway. So we're working on that, and it's important very, very important because of all of the commerce it does. And so any pause in the commerce, and even though you think about, well, Secretary Granholm said that, you know, this time next year, the pause will be over. She's, she's uh, I guess she's pushing that theory. We don't know that for a fact, but here's the fact. The pause will cause some consternation on industries and people who are going, looking for jobs and doing things. That's just a fact. People like certainty. Companies like certainty even better. It's what makes them roll. So I want to get that out of the way. And Ms. Kelly, I'm going to come back to you on our great Sabine Nation's waterway. Um, in your testimony, you highlight that Texas leads the way in wind and solar. Uh, and also, that for those of you who may or may not know, this community boasts the largest carbon capture sequestration storage facility in the country, maybe in the world for that matter. And I'll give President Obama credit because under his leadership, that was one of the projects that was done under the AIR, American Reinvestment Recovery Act in 2010, I think they opened up. I'm going way back now. So uh, this is not necessarily about dinging administrations because I think we all work together. Now, all that to say that uh, we move out a lot of, uh, I think, wind uh, projects, windmills. Talk to us, Dr. Mr. Kelly, if you will, about exactly what kind of other cargo you all move out. Yes, sir, and I'll, and I'll tell you, I'll, I'll speak, I'll broaden a little bit about the Texas Gulf Coast because each – Everybody brings a little something different to the table, and you've you've heard, sir, that uh, if you've been to one port, you've seen one port, and so we all do a little bit different. But so along the Gulf Coast, I know Galveston and Freeport and Corpus and Brownsville all handle a lot of wind energy components. Most of those are uh, brought in from overseas, and Texas, as I mentioned earlier, is the uh, le the leader in energy production by wind. Most of that's all up in the Panhandle. And if you've driven, if you've made that long drive to Lubbock or somewhere like that, you have an hour to stare at them. As you, you know, you may feel like you're not going very fast. That's where a lot of those components are going. They're also going up into Colorado, Kansas, and then there's another segment up towards Iowa and even Wisconsin and parts of Illinois, where wind energy components move through. And that's the project com component, where we handle a lot of heavy, big, wide things that help make the industry go. Uh, they'll handle project components for things like wind energy construction. Well, thank you, and I want to simply say that um, I appreciate all of y'all being here, and this is the great Southeast Texas. For my colleagues, uh, I call this the, the folks that who live and work and play here, the salt of the earth, and I've got seven seconds left, so Mr. Chairman, if I can keep it going for another two or three seconds, I will yield back, and by golly, I do. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, Gentlemen's time has expired. Let's uh, take the opportunity to thank all of our witnesses for being here today. Uh, members may have additional written questions for you, and I'll remind members they have 10 business days to submit additional questions. For the record, I ask that witnesses do their best to submit responses within 10 business days upon receipt of the questions. I ask unanimous consent to insert in the record the documents included on the staff hearing documents list. Without objection, that will be the order. And without objection, this committee will stand adjourned. Thank you.